Okay, so let's talk about basically the levels of organization, right? So uh, we can start with the cell and then go to the um, tissue and then organ, organ systems, and then the species. But really where I'm going here is if we look at the over the biggest level of organization, we're talking about the biosphere. And this is all of life on the planet above and below um, the ocean to the highest mountain. And so basically what it is, is eight kilometers above, eight kilometers below um, the planet. And so it actually doesn't encompass everything though. Um, so what I mean by that is, is uh, um, it goes above the mountains, but, um, you know, we can actually leave the biosphere. Uh, and so can um, organisms in the sense that uh, if we fly in an airplane uh, or something like that, we actually live the area where living things take place. Um, go one step below that, we talk about ecosystems. And basically um, this is where an organism lives and it's abiotic and biotic factors. In other words, the living and non-living parts of, our, of the environment uh, uh, and where they interact, their ecosystem. A community is a group of species that are different, interacting and living with each other uh, and so um, when we talk about the red-tailed hawk uh, living uh, on top of a uh, bur oak in Humiston Woods, this is a community, right? Organisms together. Obviously, population is a group of species um, that are in an area at a particular place in time, right? So because the population changes, right? So when they do the census on the on the um, on the road for Pontiac, um, they did that last in what 2010, and so um, basically it was a head count at that moment in time. It changed up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and now in 2020, do the same thing again. Um, so if we talk about the levels of organization ecologically, uh, we can talk about population ecology, right? So what is uh, the ecology within a species and how do they <coughs> interact, right? So how do individuals uh, interact within that? Community ecology, basically we're looking at uh, different species uh, coming together and how they all interact. And then ecosystem, again, we're dealing with the abiotic, which is non-living, the living, which is um, the biotic, and all of those things coming together. We're really looking at the bigger picture. Um, habitat is a uh, place where an organism lives. Uh, that's living and non-living. Uh, and it just depends on the size of the organism and how much it moves. Right, so for Plethodon cinereus, which is the red-backed salamander, um, it might live its entire life within, um, you know, the size of our classroom, maybe less. And if we talk about things like um, an elk or a bear or, you know, even a uh, gray wolf, you know, that type of thing, their habitat is huge, right? And so it, it just depends on what type of organism is and where it goes. How an organism uses its habitat, right, is, is habitat use, habitat selection. What are things that uh, allow an organism to select for a particular habitat? Um, we're talking about limiting factors, um, food, water, shelter, sunlight, mate selection, um, habitat selection is critical to those things. Um, and we as humans cause uh, that to be kind of a, an issue because we tend to bully our way in. Um, if we look at what a niche is, what is its role? What is an organism's role? Whether it's as a food source, 
or um, it keeps other organisms in check? Is it nutrient flow as far as providing energy to other organisms? What is it? Interaction, uh, that type thing. A specialist, an organism that has a small niche. And so the um, some of the finches who have a uh, nectar bill, they are a specialist. Whereas organisms like us, we're generalists. Uh, the alligator snapping turtle is a generalist. It'll eat anything that comes along in front of it. So if your finger gets in the way, that's what happens. A uh, generalist can live anywhere. A specialist means like I only can live here. So if we think of the golden toad, that's what happens. Population characteristics, when we look at a population size, all of the organisms present at a given period of time, um, and obviously that increases and decreases, and a lot of it gets dependent on us. 1918, the American passenger pigeon goes extinct. Why? The humans, uh, uh, homo sapiens, decide, hey, this is a great sport, and so uh, I've got photographs of people sitting on tops of tens of thousands that they had shot so much, and I've read counts where they've shot uh, and killed so many that the, uh, the barrels of their uh, guns ended up drooping and they couldn't shoot them anymore. And so um, there is, uh, there is um, a definite change in population size due to lots of things, and um, it's a constant fluid thing. Population density, the number of individuals within a unit area, uh, of a breeding population. And so, um, you know, population density can cause a lot of things. The more dense the population, the more disease that probably can happen. The more dense the population, the easier it is for you to find a mate. The lower the population, the harder it is for a disease to happen. Uh, space is more readily available. So population density is a very key thing for organisms. Um, if we look at distribution of organisms, so we can have what's called a random distribution or random population distribution dispersion it's like your dandelions in your yard right they just boop, there they are you know and so uh, a uniform penguin uh, pattern if we're looking at penguins uh you know greater prairie chickens uh prairie dogs uh prairie dog towns they have certain spacing that they need to have and that would be uniform uh, and then you have that clumped, oh, there's a group here, there's a group there. Uh, fish in a school would be a clumped arrangement. Um, you know, ants tend to be in a clumped arrangement, kind of a, a, that's pretty much what most organisms do. But there is some, some of the spa spacing out, especially in plant species um, that take place. Um, population characteristics, when we look at sex ratio, we're basically talking males to females, okay? If we look at these uh, uh, pyramids, age structure diagrams, what we're looking at is uh, the different number of organisms at the given age classes. And so, um, obviously, if you have, like, the alligator snapping turtle had its problem that it didn't reproduce until age 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and they were taking all of the older species and all that was left was young, then you've got a problem because you don't have anybody breeding. And so the reproductive age versus post-reproductive age is a pretty important thing. If we look at humans, right, where are we at? Uh, I would say, um, depending on our population and their different countries, do we have an aging population? Do we have a real young population? population. And so I would say an increasing rapidly we would see in a third world country uh, and then in in a country that's a developed nation probably see more of this decreasing um, age structure. So if we look at crude birth rate and crude death rate, um, what we're looking at is the number of births divided by the number of deaths per 1,000 individual, right? So birth rates, um, number of births, right? Survivorship, um, when we talk about the different types of survivorship, survivorship, what we're talking about is 
like with us, um, a type one, we have more deaths back in this older area. And so it kind of looks like this, right? Young all survive, everybody's good, everybody's good. Oh, we're starting to fail, we're getting old, see ya. Um, type two is this, this equal birth to deaths. It's, it's very linear. And then type three, we have a high mortality, uh, um, high mortality right off the bat. And then everybody starts to hang on, we're okay, we're, and then we die, right? So um, it's, it's the three different types. Um, and one thing that we need to also uh, take into effect is immigration and emigration. And so when we're dealing with that, natality is the number of births, mortality is the number of deaths in the particular population that we're talking about uh, over, over a period of time. Immigration and emigration. Immigration is coming in. Emigration is going out. And so in order for us to understand what our growth rate is of a population, we have our crude birth rate plus our emigration, immigration rate. So birth coming in minus death going out. And that gives us our overall growth rate. Pretty simple uh, to think about it. But then when we th start to think about what the population growth is, um, if we see this curve like we see here, very slow to start and then it takes off, this is exponential growth. And when we talk about this, we refer to this as a J-shaped curve, right? Now, there isn't this, this continual J-shaped growth. Eventually, we reach something called carrying capacity. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but basically, ideal small populations, we have this J-curve, and then something happens, a limiting factor. Something takes place, whether it's biological, chemical, physical, whatever it is that causes the population to decrease could be that the coyote caught the rabbit or the, the hare or whatever. So again, food, water, shelter, uh, mates, some li limiting factor. Now, environmental res resistance is all of the limiting factors, food, water, shelter, mates, sunlight, um, all of that coming together and resisting against the organisms uh, um, that is a environmental resistance. And I talked to you about there's a something limiting factor. So we have this J-shaped curve. Now this is called an S-curve or an S-shaped curve. And what happens is we start the J and then all of a sudden that limiting factor comes in. So we have the golden toads here. And what's happened is we have a mountain that we're, we're losing water. And because of that, they're losing food. And so we reach what this line is called carrying capacity. Here are some different uh, um, curves associated, uh, kind of makes sense. All right, so here we've got yeast. They grow, they grow, they grow. All of a sudden, all the food source is gone and we have this carrying capacity, right? Um, I don't know what mite this is, but again, it's doing pretty well. All of a sudden, we have a population decline. And again, we just see these different growth of population rates. And some of these can be effect, affected by other things. And right, so for example, uh, maybe in these reindeer, uh, there was a order or an ordinance or a law passed that you couldn't hunt uh, reindeer. And so in 1930, they banned hunt reindeer hunting. And all of a sudden, boop, they had this population explosion. And then they said, wait a minute, we got a problem. And in 19, uh, 1938, uh, they said, wait a minute, you can hunt again. And then all of a sudden the population declines again. Who knows? I'm just making that up. Density dependent factor, the more dense the population, uh, the more possibility that you're going to have some issue. So for example, um, if you are a fish in a school um, and sharks are around you, uh, because you're in that school, the chance for you to get consumed, um, probably pretty good. Um, competition for a mate, now you're going to have to work a little harder to find 
uh, made because there are so many individuals there. Um, density independent factors would be something like uh, a hurricane or a flood or a fire or something uh, that, that causes to wipe out a population, right? Biotic potential. How many, how many births can an organism produce? How many offspring, right? And there's two basic kinds of strategy. There's R and there's K. And the reason, the way I remember it is very simple. R means rapid, right? R selected species. We have a lot of babies very quickly, but because they have so many babies, they don't care for their young. So I think of tadpoles and I think of, of spiders and I think of, of, of organisms that just produce mice, produce a lot of babies. Um, but then I think about K-selected. And I, when I think of K-selected, I think of people and elephants and things like that. Organisms that have long gestation periods. I mean, uh, uh, I think elephants' gestation period is 28 months. Uh, I think the uh, gestation period for whales is could be even longer. And so what's the deal? Well, these, uh, these K-selected species tend to be that if they're having issues environmentally, they're, they're on the endangered species list or whatever, very similar to um, a lot of organisms, what happens is, is they can't have babies fast enough. And so um, they are, uh, it causes a problem. But as a result of that, the K-selected species, uh, species spend a lot of energy. I mean, there's a lot of energy in having babies. Not that I would personally know, but there's a lot of energy in creating offspring. And if you increase the amount of energy you put into it by caring for your offspring, um, you're wanting to make sure that that offspring survives. Whereas our selected, um, they're going to die. And so um, two different, totally different uh, uh, strategies on, on reproducing. Both have their upsides. Um, this is a, a good table here. Um, both have their downsides too. Both, this is a good table here. Are selected, small, fast development, short-lived, reproduces early, lots of offspring. Think about how a mouse can have a baby at like day 30 of its life. That's crazy. Um, no parental care, weak uh, as far as comp uh, competitively. Um, population goes, right? So um, K species, pretty much large, slow to develop, long lived, reproduce later in life, very few offspring, uh, um, slow population. This is highly big right here, parental care, right? Uh, 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 this is us. This is uh, birds. This is, yeah, I mean, case, case, case species. So um, here's the deal. Uh, as a population increases or decreases um, because of the relationships that we have, they now can cause other organisms to have a, have a problem. As the human species displaces other species, we have other organisms that are put out. This is a problem when it comes to biodiversity. We've caused global warming, climate, climate change. So our big issue is that we have to find a way to protect biodiversity, just like what we're doing with the pollen air pod, just like what we're doing with the alligator snappy turtles, right? We need to find a way to make sure that we are positively protecting and monitoring and working with species and the communities that they live in. Nature needs to be viewed in a positive light. In other words, we cannot uh, continue to have development overtake nature. We can't bulldoze our way out of this. Um, nature, when we look at resources, if we have it, we either grow it and we mine, or we mine it. And so we need to protect our, our resources um, because even the renewable ones can become non-renewable. Human population growth is the greatest pressure 
on all biodiversity and we are growing very quickly. It is imperative that we protect natural areas and find ways to preserve our biodiversity. The problem, often they're underfunded. But third world countries are now realizing that, hey, if we do ecotourism, we can bring more money here than we could if we were hunting whales. Take them whale watching. You'll make even more money. So um, preserving biodiversity is critical. That's all I have. Uh, you guys are awesome. Keep up the great work. You're making a difference. I look forward to uh, watching all that you guys do. And I can't say thank you enough for uh, all you do to make a difference in our world.